have your Bibles, I invite you to turn with me to Romans chapter 6. Romans chapter 6, where we're going to continue our study of this great book. Well, this morning as we come to Romans chapter 6, we're going to pick up where we left off. Last fall, Debbie and I took a, a uh, break to recover from our summer uh, issues, some illness, and we decided we would go to Arizona, and uh, a part of that took us up into the north part of Arizona, and one day we went to the Grand Canyon. Now, I'd been there when I was in my early teens. Our family had taken a trip there, and I remember of all the places that I've been, uh, just in terms of natural grandeur and the, and the spectacular nature of it, I mean, it was something I never forgot. I remember looking at it and just thinking, it's, it's like a real-life gigantic postcard. It was hard to take it in. So Debbie, she'd never been to the Grand Canyon, and so I was telling her about it. I said, we need to go. I want you to see it. And so there's a part of you, maybe you've had that, that experience before where you saw something that really impacted you, and then you tell somebody about it, and then when they see it, they're maybe not quite as impressed as you were. So you kind of wonder if that's going to happen. But I was telling her, and yet trying not to build it up too much, and yet that's hard to do when it comes to talking about the Grand Canyon. So uh, we drove up there. We got there to the scenic overlook, the uh, quintessential. All the pictures are from this south rim. And uh, when we looked at it, here's kind of a shot of what we saw. When we looked at it, Debbie started to jump up and down, started to cry, and then started to worship. She was so overwhelmed, she couldn't even say anything. It was so huge. It was so beautiful. It was so spectacular. In the same way, when you come to Romans, once you grasp what God has done in saving us, for the believer, it ought to be the same as a person who's never seen the Grand Canyon and more. It's breathtaking. It's spectacular. It's amazing. God's grace, God's forgiveness, God's wisdom, God's love. All that God has done in saving us. In fact, I can tell you this. When we get to heaven and we fully understand what he has done, I can promise you this. You will be so filled with awe and so filled with wonder that after you've worshipped for 10,000 years, as the hymn says, you will feel like you're just getting started. You and I literally have no idea what an amazing salvation we have. So I pray that as we walk through Romans, and as we've looked at it, and as we think about it, that you and I will again, just in our hearts, recapture what God has done for us. As we come now to Romans chapter 6, the Apostle Paul imagines, because when you really understand the comprehensiveness of grace and you get the idea of what God has done and how, how abounding, how super abounding His grace is, one could have the thought, if they hear grace correctly preached, then what's the motivation to right living? In fact, I would suggest that it's not really grace biblically preached unless when that grace is preached, it gives a person the idea that God's grace is so big, so expansive, so wonderful that no amount of sin on our part could in any way diminish it. That is when you know you've heard grace preached thoroughly, fully, abundantly, and accurately. Paul is aware of that. Paul is charged, he says, as some people go on saying, should we go on sinning, that grace may abound or that grace may increase, as some are saying. So when people heard Paul preach it, that's what they thought he was saying. But Paul anticipates that question. He anticipates the person who's going to say, well, if 
I've been forgiven so much, and grace is so huge, and grace is reigning, and if it's true where sin abounds, grace does much more super abound, then why not keep on sinning? Why does it matter how I live? And that's the question Paul answers in Romans chapter 6. And as he answers that question, he gives us a foundation of understanding that is absolutely essential for every single believer. It's a foundational understanding that not only helps us to understand why we wouldn't keep on sinning, but this morning I want you to see the answer in itself is literally a strategy for believers to use in battling sin. So this morning as we make our way through Romans chapter 6 and verses 5 through 14, what I want to do, and I'll help you write this down, I want to give you six strategies for battling sin. Six strategies for battling sin. And I would suggest to you that this is the heart of how a believer walks in righteousness, walks in holiness. This is the answer to overcoming or winning the battle with sin. If somebody doesn't understand this, then they are engaged in fighting a spiritual battle with a squirt gun. This is high-powered artillery. This is essential weaponry. This is what every Christian must have in mind if we're going to effectively win the battle against sin, if we're going to really understand grace, and we're going to really understand how you and I live in the light of grace. Six strategies for battling sin. Number one, Remember that you've been justified. Remember that you've been justified. If we want to stand strong in our faith and in the faith, then we have to remember what the Lord has done for us. We've been justified. Remember in in Romans chapter 3 and verse 4, and this is just brief review. But what God has done for us is so spectacular that honestly, it would merit review every single week, every single Sunday for the rest of our life. We've been justified. It's amazing. What are we talking about? Here's the definition. Justification is the act of God whereby he forgives the unsaved person's sin and credits to them the righteousness of Christ when through faith they believe. At the moment of your salvation, three things happen. Number one, your sins were forgiven. Past, present, future, gone. As far as the east is from the west, gone. So far as he removed our sins and transgressions from us, covered by the blood, washed by the blood of the Lamb, they are out of existence. Amazing. Number two, not only are our sins forgiven, but we are clothed in a righteousness that we could never in a, in a million years of trying possess. Outside of the free gift of Christ as he took our unrighteousness, our filthy rags, our sin-stained life, he bore it on the cross that you and I, when we put our faith in him, might be clothed in his righteousness so that when God sees us, he sees us clothed in the righteousness of Christ. And then, on top of all of that, he's the one who gave us faith to believe. Amazing, isn't it? That for by grace you've been saved through faith, and this not of yourself. You didn't come up with the faith. It wasn't your faith. To every man is given the measure of faith. Romans 10, 17, faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God as you heard the word of God. God gave you faith in that moment to believe that you might be saved. So we are justified Romans chapter 5 and verse 1, Paul reminds us again, therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Our sins are gone. God has been so good. There's a second strategy. Realize that you've been united with Christ. All of this review is review from last week. We talked extensively about this fact that you and I are now in Christ. We're we're spiritually united, and the way to understand that is we are in Him. The moment we came to Christ, we were united with Him. Before coming to Christ, 
We were in Adam, and we've talked about that for several weeks. Every person in the world falls into one of two categories. You're either in Adam or you're in Christ, period. We're all born in Adam. We all start there. We're in Adam. We were spiritually united with Adam. If you've never given your heart to Christ, you're still in Adam, which means that whatever happened to him happened to you. When he sinned, it's as if we sinned. Because we were in him, not only we could say genetically, but because he was representative, he was our representative head, the head of humanity. So whatever he did affected us. We were in him. That's why every person who is born is born as a sinner. It's the doctrine of original sin. Listen, it's not just in Romans chapter 5 and verse 12, but you find it in the Bible. In Psalm chapter 51 and verse 5, David writes this, for I was born a sinner. That's always been the understanding of God's people. We're born sinners. We don't, we don't become a sinner when we sin. We're born. We're in Adam. But when a person comes to Christ... We are spiritually united with him, which means it's as if what happened to him happened to us. Now, Paul mentions three things, and we looked at this last time. Again, I'm just trying to help you understand this, but this is foundational. If you're going to overcome sin, you got to remember that you, your sins are gone that you are clothed in righteousness, that God has given you faith to believe. You've got to remember that you're no longer in Adam. You are in Christ. You're united with Christ. What happened to him happened to you. And what is it that happened to him? Well, he died. And because he died, it's as if we died. Romans 6, verse 3, look at it. Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ. And we're not talking about water baptism. We looked at that last time. We're talking about being baptized into the body of Christ. We're talking about becoming a Christian, becoming a a part of the body of Christ. All of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death. We were united with him. We, when he died, we died. Because he was buried, we were buried. Look at it in Romans chapter 6 and verse 4. We were buried, therefore, with him. And number three, because he was raised from the dead, we are raised from the dead. Not will be. That is true. There's a sense where we are yet to be raised, our body resurrected, our body transformed, but we have spiritually been raised from the dead. Romans chapter 6 and verse 4, just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, by the power of the Father, we too might walk in a newness of life. We shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. What happened to Christ happened to you. He died, you died. He was buried, you were buried. He died to the realm of sin. You died to the realm of sin. The moment you got saved, it's as if you were at the cross. You were in him. What happened to him happened to you. He was buried, which was proof that he was done with this life. You were buried. It's proof you spiritually are done with the realm of sin, the reign of sin. He was raised to a newness of life. You're raised to a newness of life. Paul will say in Ephesians, we're we're seated in heavenly places with Christ. We're already resurrected by that same power. Now let me just say this. If you want to win the battle with sin, it begins with renewing your mind and thinking on spiritual truth. It's Justification, talking about this, is not something we just move on from. It's something we constantly live in the awareness of that reality of what Christ did for us. It's not just for when you and I study Romans. It's for when you wake up tomorrow morning. It's not just for when you're in church. It's when you are tempted on Tuesday evening at 6. You have to remember, you've been justified. You have to remember, 
you're in Christ. You're united with him. You died. You were buried. You were resurrected. That leads us to a third principle I want you to see. Resolve in your mind that the old you is gone. Remember, we quote it all the time, if any man's in Christ is a new creation, the old has passed away, behold, all things are new, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. It's a brand new you. Look at it, Romans chapter 6, this is what Paul's saying. For we know that our old self was crucified with him. That's the old you was crucified. Not is being crucified, not does need to be crucified. It was crucified. The old Jew's gone. In order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. Every Christian, look at this, needs to know this. Do you know this? Do you understand this? Do you know the old you is gone? Gone. Dead. Buried. Covered up. Out of sight. And do you live your life in light of this knowledge? Are you certain about it? You say, certain about what? That your old self was crucified with Christ. That once we were in Adam, but when we came to Christ, that person we were in Adam was crucified with Christ. That old self, that self that had been born a sinner, that had sinned in Adam, that was under condemnation, that was facing God's eternal wrath, that old self died with Christ, was crucified with Christ. That person is dead. That person has been buried. That person is gone. That person does not exist. Period. That's really good news. It's a brand new you. That this is why. This is the basis for why Paul will write this in Romans chapter 8 and verse 1. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Why is there no condemnation? Because the old you that was in Adam is gone. gone. If you're in Christ, the old you is gone. Do you understand that? Once you come to Christ, the old you is gone. And it happens only once. You don't keep dying. It's not a process. There are some Christians who keep trying to kill the old man, but he's gone. Death happens once. Hebrews chapter 9, it's appointed unto man once to die. And after that, the judgment. Now, I mean, look at it. Romans chapter 6, verse 10. For the death he died, he died to sin once and for all. You die once for all. If you're in Christ, that old man, you died once. He is gone. Now, listen, you have to resolve in your mind that you're a new person. And honestly, some of you have forgotten yourself. Some of you have never really dwelt on this thought until it became so real to you that it just, it was just a part of your understanding. The old you is gone. The new you is all that remains. Now let me, let me just say this. You have to resolve in your mind that the old self is gone. And here's the reason why. Because the main way to stop living as if the old man were not there is to resolve in your, in your mind that he is not there. The only way to live as if the old man is not there is to resolve in your mind and to know with all of your heart and all of your soul and all of your understanding your old man isn't there. As long as you think your old man is there, you're going to make allowance for that. He's not there. For we know, look at it, verse 6. For we know. We know, 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 we know. Do you know this? 
I would suggest that most Christians don't. And if they do know it, in theory, they don't know it in terms of conviction. Our old self was crucified with him. Gone. That the body of sin might be brought to nothing and no longer, we'd no longer be enslaved to sin. The old man was crucified, so two things could happen. One, the body of sin might be brought to nothing. And two, you'd no longer be enslaved to sin. You say, what is the body of sin? When we're talking about the body of sin, what is that? Well, what's, it, what's this word? Body. That's your body. The body of sin is your body. Now listen closely. Your spirit, your inner being, has been redeemed. When I was born again, I became a brand new person. I did not get, at that moment, a brand new body. I still have my physical, my old physical body. And this body is still subject to sin, my physical body. The proof of that is this physical body is in a state of decay. I know it's hard to believe when you look at me, but it's in a state of decay. <laughs> Someday this body's going to die. Someday this body's going to be gone. And this body is not only subject to sin, but sin still wants to control this body. Sin wants to influence this body's thoughts. Sin wants to inflame or incite this body's instincts. Sin wants to control this body's emotions. The body of sin, as Paul calls it in Romans 6, is what the Bible repeatedly calls the flesh, the sinful flesh, depending on your translation. I think the NIV uses the term sinful nature. It's all the same. So I've been united. I've been justified. I've been united with Christ. My old man died with Christ, was buried with Christ. It's dead to the rule. I'm dead to the rule of sin. I'm finished with the realm of sin. My old man is gone. I'm no longer the same person I used to be. I'm in Christ. And yet, while all of that is true of me, it's not true of my body. Sin still wants to work in me and is, in fact, constantly pinging, constantly trying to control. And I don't mean by that that the body is evil. It just means my body has not yet been redeemed. So there is a battle with sin in our body, in our flesh. Now, let me tell you why this is important and why I'm taking a little bit of time with this. A lot of Christians don't understand this concept. So when they fall into sin, especially if it's a besetting sin, especially if it's a, if it's a sin that has some kind of repetitiveness to it, seems to be somewhat, we talked a few Wednesday nights ago about stronghold could be a, a, an area where it appears there is a stronghold, and oftentimes, because sin wants to control, if Christians give it an inch, it takes a mile, and it does gain a, a foothold in a person's life. What happens as a result is then Christians find themselves saying, well, how can I even be a Christian if I'm constantly having this struggle. So what happens is people begin to doubt whether they're a believer at all. Can I just say this to you pastorally? This is very, very important for you. It is spiritually destructive to question your salvation every time you fall into sin. I'm going to say that again. It is spiritually destructive for you to question your salvation every time you fall into sin. Honestly, what's happened, especially in holiness uh, movements, so you could put the AG in that, you could put uh, the Nazarenes in that, you could put the Wesleyans in that, we could go on and name some of the holiness movements. Preachers have been so afraid 
of people falling into the, to the air that once you're saved, it doesn't matter how you live, that they have destabilized people with the thought, you probably aren't saved at all. This has done a huge disservice to the kingdom. It has not been helpful. And I think, I think, honestly, it betrays a lack of understanding in many cases, not every case, of Romans chapter 6. Because what happens is, if people don't know if they're saved or not, at the very least, that, that initiates a sense that they're alienated from God, that they're distant from God. If you do not understand what justification is, if you do not understand that you're in Christ, if you do not understand that your old man is dead, then when sin is there, and it will be, there's nobody that's hitting perfection this side of heaven. What happens is, when people fall into sin, then they feel alienated from God because they don't understand grace, and they don't understand salvation, and they don't understand what happened to them. So they don't understand how to respond to that. So they feel alienated from God, and because they feel alienated, they feel distant. Because they feel distant, then they, then they feel like then suddenly, over time, they eventually lose heart, and they just kind of keep a distance. Or they're like Adam and Eve. They're hiding in the garden. They're, they're hiding, and God's coming and looking. Listen, let me just say this. You say, well, now, doesn't it, does it not matter then if we sin? Is that what you're saying? That's not what I'm saying. I've never said that one time. You're saying, well, I, I think God cares about sin, and I think, I think when, listen, you need to go back and read Romans. Your sins are forgiven. You're under grace. So what's grace do? When there's sin, grace disciplines the believer. Now listen, in, in Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 5, have you forgotten the exhortation that addresses you as sons? My son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor be weary when reproved by him, for the Lord disciplines the one he loves and chastises every son whom he receives. It is for discipline that you have to endure. God is treating you as sons. For what son is there whom his father does not discipline? I mean, so you fall into sin. Guess what grace is going to do? Grace is going to to initiate, God's going to initiate discipline. But here's how discipline works. Let me, let me tell you how it works in our home. Not anymore. I don't discipline my kids. I'm, whew, I'm over that. <laughs> discipline didn't make me say, well, you did wrong. I don't want anything to do with you. If you do that, you're a terrible parent. When my child did wrong, here's, here's what I knew immediately. I knew when my children were struggling and doing things that were not right that they didn't need less time with me, they needed more time. It didn't make me want to be farther away. It made me want to get closer to them. It, 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 it made me say, you know what, I need to get in there and do a little correction and a little training, but I need to do it in the context of a relational love so that they understand I'm not angry, I'm just getting close because I love them and I care for them and I want to help them and I want them to overcome and this is going to destroy them and we can't have that happen, so I'm going to discipline. Are you with me? Listen, God, when you sin as a believer, is not saying, well, if that's how you are, and when you repent, then I'll, no. God is saying, oh boy, I love you too much to let you go. I got big plans for you. And what I've started, I'm going to finish. And I'm going to get as close as I have to get. And I'm going to use whatever means that I can to get my arms around you and to love you. And it might hurt because I may apply, and I know this is not politically correct and I don't care, I may apply the Board of Education to the seat of learning. And moving right along. When you grasp this doctrine, <laughs> the old man's dead. 
When you fall into sin, you won't be asking, am I a Christian or not? Here's what you'll say. But you'll only say this if you know this, and you'll only know this if you meditate on it, and if you get it in your heart and settle it in your mind, and it will do more than almost anything I can think of to strengthen you in your battle with sin. Here's what you'll say. You'll say, well, of course I'm a Christian. I'm justified. My old man was crucified. I'm a new person in Christ, and I am accepted by God, and nothing I do can change that. And this sin I've allowed cannot separate me from God. And Paul's going to make this clear. For I'm convinced that neither height nor depth nor... I mean, he goes on and list this big long thing at the end of Romans can separate us. The sin I allowed of not separate me from God. It does not affect my salvation. I don't need to be saved again. I am a new man. Why did I sin? I sinned because of this body of sin, and someday God's going to redeem it. The presence of this sin does not invalidate my salvation, but it is certainly inconsistent with my salvation. I've died to sin. How can I live in it any longer? I don't want to. I'm a new man. I've got to start acting like it. Do you follow what I'm saying? My old man is dead. I'm a new person. I need to live like it. Number four, reckon yourself dead to sin. Verse seven, for one who has died has been set free from sin. You don't sin after you die, after you're dead. And when, when you die, you're done with sin. That's a general principle. That's axiomatic. When a person dies, they can no longer sin. They're no longer under the rule of sin. They cannot be tempted by sin because they're dead. Death is the end of sin. You don't charge a dead man with a crime. Now watch this, Romans chapter 6, and, and think about this because We're talking about Christ. Now, if we've died with Christ, which we know we did, we believe that we also live with him. We know that Christ, being raised from the dead, will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. And death instantly doesn't have dominion over you. You're going to die, but death's not the end. Death's just a door to the full experience of God's glory. Death is just a way of getting rid of this body of sin. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. Paul's point is this. Jesus finished with sin and death once and forever. And they have, sin and death have no power over him. After dying, he was resurrected so that now, what does it say? He lives exclusively. He lives to God. Jesus lives exclusively for the glory of God. Now remember, we're in him. So when he died, we died. When he was buried, we were buried. When he was raised, we were raised. And he lives exclusively for the glory of God. Guess what? You and I live exclusively for the glory of God. You say, oh, but, but what about when I sin? Oh, where sin abounds, grace does much more abound. Even in our sin, I'm going to be careful in this statement, but it's true. Even in our sin, God is glorified. Not that we sin that he might be glorified, but in our sin, where sin abounds, grace does much more abound. It's very, very interesting. Verse 11, here's what you do with that. So you also must consider yourselves. The ESV uses the word consider, which is a fair translation, but maybe not strong enough. I like the word reckon. It's not like the Beverly Hillbillies. Well, I reckon it's... <laughs> what, what the word reckon? <laughs> it means to consider and keep it before you. In other words, it's more than knowing. It's the idea of continually thinking about. It's having it first and foremost in your mind. So you also must have first and foremost in your mind this thought. You're dead to sin and alive in God. Alive to God in Christ Jesus. First and foremost, you're dead to sin. You're dead to it. You're dead to it. 
Now listen, what I want you to see is we're not talking a bunch of do's and don'ts here. When, when the rules become the tools of discipleship, legalism is the result. But on the other hand, when grace reigns, it's, it's a whole different it's a whole different paradigm. It's not do this, don't do this. I, it's, listen, I got, a, I got foremost in my mind. I'm dead to sin. I'm alive to God in Christ Jesus. I'm in him. I'm alive to God. I'm dead to sin. My old man's gone. As believers, we need to think regularly about the fact we're dead to sin and alive to God. Consequently, sin's not my master. Christ is. When sin is present, when the temptation is there, I need to have first and foremost in my mind, I need to reckon, I need to consider, and keep on considering, keeping it before me, that I'm dead to sin, and I'm not going to listen to sin. I'm alive to God, and I'm living for His glory. We're not talking here about claiming a promise. We're talking about accepting a fact. The fact is, you're dead to sin. Whether you realize it or not, if you're a believer, you're dead to sin. God doesn't command us to die to sin. He tells us we are dead to sin and alive in him. Let me give you this little truth principle here. Keeping that fact that we have died to sin in our minds is the beginning of experiencing God's power in overcoming sin in our lives. When people sin, it's because they've forgotten that. Or because, sadly, tragically, they never knew it in the first place. Now, listen, this is, this is, this is a theological explanation for not only our standing in Christ and not only understanding what Christ has done for us, but for battling sin. And if you don't get this, you have nothing left to you but a list of rules and good luck. Reckon yourself dead to sin. Keep first and foremost in your mind I'm alive to God. I'm alive. I'm, I'm new. I'm not who I was. I'm not in Adam. I am in Christ. Get it in your spirit. Let it penetrate your heart. Refuse to offer your body to sin. Refuse. We're dead to sin. But listen to this. You will never be dead to temptation. Now think of this. Jesus was dead to sin, but he was not dead to temptation. He was tempted in every way as we are, yet without sin. So we're dead to sin, but sin is not dead. Sin still remains in our bodies. Say this again. Sin still remains in our bodies and if left unchecked, will reign. Sin still remains in our bodies, and if left unchecked, will rule with an iron fist. And while sin can't dominate the Christian's being, some of you know this by firsthand experience. It can dominate your body and your mind. But it does not have to. Watch this. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body. There it is. Don't let it do it. Some of you right now are in a situation, and I, and I realize I'm thinking, I'm really speaking maybe to a minority here, but I think this is important to say. Some of you are saying, I wish I'd have heard this long ago because I didn't check sin, and it is ruling me, and what do I do? Live in Romans 6. Take this message, 
listen to it 500 million times till you can quote every verse and you can understand what the verses are saying. Remember, you've been justified. Realize you're in Christ. You know what? The old man's dead. Dead. Gone. Refuse to let sin reign in your body. Do not let sin therefore reign in your mortal body to make it make you obey its passions. And, and there the word is ep. It, it's got the prefix epe. You're, you're driving. You're, you're those, those irresistible. That, that sin that constantly is coming at you, it's driving you. It doesn't have to. If you let sin reign in your body, it will try to make you obey. It will attempt to dominate you. If you give it an inch, it will take a mile. Now, verse 13. Do not present your members... To sin as instruments, so members, what are we talking about there? Your, your members, like your hands, your feet, your mind, your eyes, your ears, your mouth. Don't present the parts of your body to sin as instruments for unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God. Now, I want to point out something. It's a little bit theological, but I think it's really very heartening. Notice it said, do not present yourself to sin. You know why I didn't say don't present yourself to sin? Because for the Christian, that's impossible. You can't present yourself because God already owns you. There's a new you. God already bought you. You're already in Christ. You can't present Christ to sin. You can't do it. It's impossible. You can present what's left of sin. The one place sin is, that's your body. But you, you couldn't present to sin even if you tried. It's not even possible. But you can give the members of your body to sin. You can let your mouth say things it shouldn't, and you can let your mind think things it shouldn't, and you can let your heart feel things it shouldn't, and you can let your body do things that it shouldn't. But if you give yourself to God and you don't give the parts of your body to God, then the devil will have his way in your life. And let me say this again. Give yourself to God. God, here I am, save me. Boom, you're saved. You've given yourself to God, but if you don't surrender the parts of your body to God, then the devil will have his way in your life. And that explains where some of you are today, your believers, but the devil is running you he is running you. He is working you. You've let, you've let sin dominate your thinking. You can't engage in a conversation with a member of the opposite sex without pornographic thoughts. S sin is dominate. You can't, you, you, you can't control your emotions. You, you can't, I mean, do you follow what I'm saying? If you give sin, if you give sin any kind of foothold, it will go far beyond what you, what you imagined. How does a person prevent sin from ruling in their body? How do you live a holy life? Number one, fill your mind with sound doctrine. And number two, fill your time with serving God with all that's within you. Become all about Christ. Give yourself fully to living for Christ. I mean, this is what Paul says, 1 Corinthians 10, verse 31. So whether you eat or drink, even in the smallest things of life, eating or drinking, even the most mundane things, or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. And if you can't do it for the glory of God, don't do it. Because your life's for his glory. Christ gave himself for us, died for us, redeemed us. We're a new creation. We're headed to eternal glory. So how in the world could we voluntarily let sin and Satan use our body to accomplish their wicked ends to attack, to assault, and to oppose the very God who loved us? 
So that's Paul's point. It's absolutely unthinkable. Why would you do that? Do, would you realize there's no do's or don'ts in this? I mean, it's simply saying, listen, this doesn't make any sense. Why would you want to do this? This is, this, is, this is like slapping chains. This is like putting yourself under. Why would you put yourself under a bondage by giving an opportunity for sin in your life? Refuse to offer your body to sin. And I close with this. Rejoice in the fact that you are under grace. Oh, this is so good. For sin will have no dominion over you since you are not under law but under grace. I want to I say this is not a command. This, this is not Paul telling you to do something here. This is not Paul giving you a cause and effect. If you do this, then this will happen. This is Paul, at the end of this thing, giving you one of the greatest encouragements in all of Scripture. Why shouldn't I allow sin to reign in my body? For sin will have no dominion over you. God will not. This is what it's saying. God will not allow sin to have dominion over you. He sent his son with the primary objective of entirely and completely and forever delivering you and me from sin. He is not going to let it have dominion over you. Sin does not, there's a whole new you. It's not under sin. And guess what? If you let your body come under the dominion of sin, God is not going to let that continue. He is not. He will not. Because he is faithful to complete what? The work he began. I don't know about you. It's very encouraging. Then he explains, for sin will have no dominion over you. Watch this. Since you are not under law. There are only two categories of people. There are those who are in Adam, those who are in Christ, those who will be judged, and those who will be justified. Those who are under law, subject to the law, will be judged by the law, and those who are under grace. If you're under grace, you're not under law. We aren't under law. We won't be judged by the law, either the law in the Bible or the law that's written on our hearts. The law could never deliver you from sin. In fact, all it can do is bolster sin case against you and increase sin's dominion over you. But as a Christian, you are not under the law. You're under grace. This is amazing. Grace reigns. My sins are forgiven, past, present, and future. Grace reigns. Christ's righteousness is mine. Grace reigns. I'm a new person. The old man's passed away. Grace reigns. I'm dead to sin and alive to God. Grace reigns. I can live my life for his glory, for his purpose. Grace reigns. Sin doesn't have dominion over me. I'm not under law. I'm under grace. Grace reigns. And he who completed, who began the work in me, is faithful to complete it. Grace reigns. And that is a strategy for battling sin.